is, is that aggression is a problem because we don't like it. It doesn't bother me that you don't, you know, read well. Okay. Well, I mean, it, you know what I'm saying? It, it, when I live my life and I know that you don't read well, it doesn't really upset me that much. I mean, maybe it should, but if you attacked me, that's a problem. Or if you attacked your wife. So the, the thing is, what I'm going to suggest to you from the data we have is that the person has a lot of problems because of this arousal modulating deal. It's just that aggression is like a number one as far as society goes. And I'll also show you when I show you their mood state stuff is that they do get better. In fact, even some of their performance, their cognitive performance gets better. So it's not just the aggression that we end up treating. The aggression is indeed a symptom of something, a disorder that they have. So usually somebody will catch me early on when I said that your aggression is secondary to a mental illness. And then I tell you that one of the aggressions is, is biological. Well, usually somebody will say, well, doesn't that mean it's secondary to something, the impulsive aggression? Well, yeah, it is. It's not secondary to a mental illness that we, quote unquote, have diagnostics for. But clearly, it's one of them is biological in nature. But no, those are, that's a great question you ask about the provocation because, you know, one of the definitions of impulsive aggression is indeed, it is beyond the provocation, okay, which implies that you know, there would, be a, there would be an appropriate response. And my student, Sarah, she argues with me day in and day out that it's, a, in fact, even, you know, this will make some of you really even cringe, that there were even moments when it was okay for the man to hit his wife because she pushed him to it and pushed him beyond his ability to control himself. So she works into this, you know, and, it, and then and she's a woman, and don't, don't get mad at me, I tell her she's wrong, but she works into this theory that she has, the idea that, that your, the way you respond to an individual should take into account their ability to control their behavior. Did you see what I'm saying? So knowing that they cannot control their behavior well, you should not push them to a point at which they will know. So if they do respond, you did have some responsibility in that response. So she's a very free-thinking young woman. That's why I love her so much. So. Right, and some people, and people have different thresholds. I mean, even in this room, hoping none of us are quote unquote violent in this context, we all would have different, you know, and that's why, for instance, in our criminal system, you know, if a man comes home and he finds his woman in bed with another man and kills him, that's very different than if he had plotted to kill his coworker so that he could get the whole company. We treat them differently. One is a passion killing. We even use those terms. You know, whereas one is a, is, a, is a killing with special circumstances, you plan it, it's a death penalty case. You know, in death penalty cases, if we can show that a person has a lack of control or didn't plan it out ahead of time, then we treat that differently. So what you're saying is very true, even in the criminal system, it's not maybe as extreme as my student says, because I would tell her that she's, I would say that our society has deemed it inappropriate to respond physically, except for self-defense. That's why I said what we're really studying is control. We're not really studying aggression. Aggression is normal. It's normal for you to be angry, and it's normal for you to be aggressive, but our societal constraints tell us, don't, at least in the West particularly, don't be physical. That's wrong, except to protect yourself from a physical attack. And even then, if you just get in my face and start yelling and screaming at me and say, I'm gonna kill you, if I'm physical then, then it's my fault. You actually have to do something to me. Whereas in other, you know, in other cultures, perhaps they're a little, they have a different boundary. Now, the context of, uh, or the uh, the concept of explosive violence is multicultural. You find it in virtually every kind of society, every type of culture. In fact, I'll give you one example, and that is we use the term all the time, running amok. Am okay? That is a, you know, kind of a island. It's a really bizarre, it's like psychotic trigger reaction that Annalise Pontius talks about. The person loses control and begins killing people. Uh, it's a psychotic kind of a, a, a state. Uh, and until very recently, no one had ever been taken alive. They actually had to kill them to stop them. 
So very few individuals who have this problem actually have been studied. But again, there, there are ideas of losing control of your violence or your anger. You'll find those in many cultures around. And also the idea of planning out your violence. Um, you know, least to say, I guess at this point I can kind of fudge and use war a little bit. You know, we all, we all are violent. We all do it all over the place. So what's going on in these guys' brains? And again, I'm talking about impulsive, aggressive individuals. Um, let me describe this to you. I'm going to talk about two different types of brain activity. One is called an evoked potential and one is called an event-related potential. One is controlled by the stimuli on the outside and one is controlled by cognitive processing as it's going on in your brain. The first is going to be what's called an evoked potential. And I can get this, this little potential here, which is a P1, N1, P2. Remember, positive is down in physiology, except if you're in Europe and then it's up. And negative is up, okay? So, uh, and one means 100 milliseconds and two means 200 milliseconds. It's basically, that's when it happens after the stimulus. The stimulus would have occurred over here somewhere, which my light's going out, over here somewhere, and then you get a P1, N1, P2. Now, the way I can evoke this is I can flash lights in your eyes, just flash, 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 flash. You just sit there and do nothing. In fact, you even can have your eyes closed. It goes right through your eyelids. Or I can have you listen to tones. Beep, 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 beep. Just, and and I'll, I will get this. Okay? Now, what's, and that, you may say, oh, well, that's really interesting, but, as most people don't. But uh, the, uh, the thing is, what, about it is there's a couple of things. Number one, the P1, remember it's the size and the latency that becomes important in these potentials. The P1 has been shown to be a measure of what's called sensory gating. Okay? I'm not going to like take you on this long trip of neurobiology, I promise. It's going to make it real simple. Sensory gating, which means this. It's a big fancy word to say. The larger it is, the mean, in essence, means more activated your sensory systems are, more ready for stimuli. Okay? So if it's big, they're ready. They're ready for the, sensa the sense, okay? the sensation. If it's small, then they're not as activated, which means they won't take in your auditory system, your visuals. They won't take in the sensory information as well. The N1 is been suggested to be the onset of attention or orienting. Okay? So the larger it is, it means more the more attentional resource you're putting. So if it's small, that means you didn't put a lot of resource. You didn't activate a lot of resources for that. If it's large, that means you're activating more and more resources. Does that make sense? And the P2 is some little bit later attentional processing we're really not going to talk about. But the entire complex moves as a one unit, okay? It is basically the onset of attention and orienting, okay, in a sensory aspect. And the earlier it is, that means that, it, that, your, that your attentional processes came on very early, and the later it is, it means that it came on very late. So normally in people that have an attention deficit, you would suggest it to be late, is it doesn't come on as well, and it would be too small because they're not activating enough resources. All right, does that make sense? So, in, when we look at impulsive aggressors, what is it that we find in these individuals? Well, we find a couple of things. First, let's look at the N100. And the, the CZ, that's just an electrode placement. That's the one right in the middle of the head. That's where you usually see the N1 the biggest. We find, you see the red line is impulsive aggressors and the yellow is non-aggressors. We find that in impulsive aggressors, their N100 is way too big. Now you might go, wait a minute, that means they have better attention? Okay, well, it's all going to make sense in a minute. It's way too big, okay? Um, it's, in fact, uh, well, I'll show you that in a minute. And th this other one's a normal N100. Okay, remember, this is just the flashing lights. Now, if we look at the P1, I do this a little bit different. Low, medium, and high means different intensities of light because I can change it by changing the intensity of the light. I can make it bigger or smaller. So that's low intensity of light, medium, and high. If I look at the P1, I see that the red again is the impulsive aggressor. The amplitude of the P1 is much smaller. It's too small compared to a normal, which means that the sensory system is not as activated that's receiving the information, so it's not going to process it as well which may make you start to wonder, well, why was the N1 larger? Well, maybe that's because they're over-processing in an attempt to deal with this deficit. They're turning everything on when they shouldn't be, which is just as bad as if you turn nothing on. 
you turn everything on when you shouldn't, that's not good either. Okay? That doesn't mean you do better. In fact, most instances it means you do worse. Now, if you look at the latency, remember I told you the whole thing moves as a one unit, so if you just look at the N1, you get a feel for the whole thing. You see their, their latency is way too early. Well, you may say again, well, wait a minute. If it's early, doesn't that mean it's coming on early, like they're jumping on it, like they have better attention? Well, you might think that, but the problem is, is that it's too early, and you're having this garbage in, garbage out phenomenon. The sensory system is not activated, okay, at the level it should be. They're not processing the sensory information that's coming in well, so they're allocating all their resource and they're turning everything on early in an attempt to process whatever they can. This latency and the amplitude in the N1, they're compensatory mechanisms. They're, they're, they're attentional system is always turned on in an attempt to process, but remember, it's just, it, the information that's going into it is a mess. It, so they, they, even if they, they, they don't have anything that they can process, that's the problem. So if you think about that for a second, so this is the earliest processing that we're looking at, this is very, very early. Um, kind of, you know, almost like, you know, think about precognitive in a sense. The thing is, is that if that's what's being put in for them to make a decision, you can only imagine what their decision is ultimately going to be. Their, their decision is going to be based on partially processed bad information. Okay? So when that has to be done quickly, or they have other underlying problems or agitated or whatever, you, the decisions are going to be poor. Okay? All right. Now let me, I'm going to just describe this one. I'm going to take a, take a quick break for you guys. This is, again, the N1, uh, P1, N1, P2. Here's impulsive aggressors over here and non-aggressors here. And they have three different intensities of light, low, medium, and high. You get a phenomenon in impulsivity called augmenting reducing. Has anybody ever heard of that? Then augmenting reducing, what that means is as you increase the intensity of the light, And like I said, impulsive people, not impulsive aggressors, just people who are impulsive, have been found to be augmenters. And people who are not impulsive have been found to be reducers or not change. Okay? And it's been suggested from through Eisnick and Gray and a lot of different people that what that is is that it shows an arousal deficit. That you've heard the term optimum level of arousal, that they, they are at a level of arousal that's too low and that they're trying to increase their arousal by seeking out stimulation, like jumping out of airplanes and riding motorcycles and using drugs and doing, these are stimulating things, okay? So we find that phenomenon in the impulsive aggressor. As you increase the intensity of the light, their N1 gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, remember, it was already too big to begin with. Which, so that suggests, initially, they, they have not only an attentional problem, but there's some kind of underlying arousal problem which brings us back to that P1 being too small, which then, if you have a PhD in neuroscience and it's been beat into you, makes you think about the reticular activating system, which suggests that their brain stem is not activating their brain at an appropriate level, which at that point, you would say, well, then they're gonna have all kind of cognitive deficits because if, you know, if the computer only, you know, if it's supposed to be 120 and you're only running 60 into it, it isn't gonna work. It's just not going to work. And so it's the same thing here. If, you're, if the activation is low, and, the, and probably the lobe of your brain that's most sensitive to problems in arousal is your frontal lobe, your executive function, you're simply not going to make appropriate decisions and planning and strategies and the things that I've talked about before. So what I'm going to show you as we go through here is what clearly looks like an arousal modulating problem. And let me say one last thing, I want to take a quick break. Uh, I alluded to this earlier, and that is the idea that just being impulsive does not make you impulsive aggressive. People who are impulsive have an arousal problem. They are low aroused. They seek out stimulation, so they do impulsive things. You can demonstrate that with heart rate, you can demonstrate that with EEGs, all kinds of things. It's been just demonstrated since the 30s, okay? Now, people who are impulsive aggressive, they've also been suggested to be low aroused. But that's a problem because you know that impulsive people aren't all aggressive. 
The difference is people who are impulsive aggressive, it's not that they are low aroused, it's that they can't modulate their arousal. When they have no stimulation coming in, they're under aroused. When they have any stimulation come in, they go up through the roof and they stay there. They can't come back down. So that's the agitated state. That's the loss of control. So if I only run 60 through this thing, it doesn't work. But if I run 500 through it, it doesn't work either. In fact, it blows the whole thing out. So, you know, it's, it's bad to have too little and it's bad to have too much. And there, that's where he tried to use the boat. You know, I tried to explain this to him, but I didn't come up with the boat thing. He says that they go, they're normally like at 10 and then they go to 50 like that. And that's, that, I guess that's not a bad, I didn't like it, but that's not too bad. They're too low when you're doing nothing. But then when any stimulus comes in, like you're, you're talking about push to the limit. Remember, their limit's real low because they're almost there anyway. So any stimulus, the pasta's burned. That's it. They're over. They're, you know, their heart's pounding. They're agitated. They're out of control. And at that point, their processing isn't good. They don't remember the incident well. They don't understand what they're doing, things like that. All right, so let's take a 10-minute break. That would put us at 2.45. And then when we come back, I will show you a little bit more physiological data that looks specifically at cognitive function. And then we'll look at some drug data uh, where we use different anticonvulsants on both premeditated and impulsive. And then we'll have a, a question and discussion time where uh, we can talk about all this. All right. I, I wanted to mention real quick um, on, on your procedures manual, um, one of the things is on page... Um, 11, we have listed out all of the publications that we have in which these actual procedures have been used to classify individuals. And in this list, you'll find inmates, uh, college students, and psychiatric patients. So no matter what the population is that you deal with, there's probably an article here that deals with that population and then use these actual procedures. So uh, that might be useful to you. Another thing is if you, my email is on the front here, and if you, uh, perhaps a library at university isn't all that great, uh, mine isn't. Uh, I have almost all of these in PDF form, and if you want to email me or give me your card, uh, I can, um, if you want a particular one of these, I can email it to you and you can have it right there to print out. So uh, just let me know. I'll be happy to Another thing is if you're in a practice and you, you, know, you have a violent patient or you come across one and you're, you have questions or you'd like some information, we have people call us on a weekly basis from all over the country that, you know, what, is it, what would you think of this? We, think that we are happy to help in any way we can. So please let us know uh, and we uh, will assist you in any way we can. Well, let's continue our discussion. We're starting to talk about physiology a little bit, and what I, to summarize, what I just talked about earlier was very early sensory processing. The, the very onset of attention and the activation of the sensory system. And what I was able to show is that there's some kind of arousal problem. Their sensory systems, and in essence, their whole brain is not activated at a level it should be. And so when the sensory information comes in, it doesn't, it's garbage in. I mean, that's basically the statement. It's garbage in. And so what they're doing is they're allocating all of their attentional resource and they're turning everything on early, even for sensory information they shouldn't. So not only do they misidentify things, but they probably identify things that aren't really even there. You know, and, and I'm going to talk in a few minutes about emotional cues and we'll, we'll talk about that because my student Sarah, the one that I mentioned that says there's appropriate violence, uh, she actually her area of focus is emotional cues and do they miss those and she uses pictures of emotional stimuli and we'll talk about that this is a p300 i mentioned this earlier this i showed you the three different groups and how they have a different p300 two of the groups have a cognitive uh, deficit and one doesn't um, you can get this two basically use two different kinds of stimuli auditory or visual usually use what's called an oddball task and that's the task i described to you it's a, a set of stimuli in which there's two stimuli. One is a very high probability stimulus and one's a very low probability stimulus. So it might be a tone, lots of low tones and a few high tones, and you're supposed to count the high ones. And so to the high one, we'd get this nice peak here. Or it's an A and a B. 
the A comes up 80% of the time and the B comes up 20 and you push a button every time you see the B. Okay. Again, to the B you get a very large P300 and that's suggestive of an allocation of resource. You're making a decision on how to categorize that and how long it takes it to peak is how long, in essence, that's related to how long it takes you to respond and how large it is, again, is the amount of resource. So you don't want to have a small late one because that means that you don't allocate enough resource and it took you too long to process it. Those kind of go hand in hand. If you don't allocate a lot of resource, it's probably going to take you longer to process it. So this is a study that was done by one of my former students, Charles Mathias. Um, and the, the girls in my lab kind of call these, the, what do they call them? They call them the crazy pine cones or something. So they, uh, Charles is at the University of Texas uh, Medical School in Houston now working with the aggression group there. But what this is, it's supposed to be the top of a head. And that's the nose down there and the right and left ear. And those little dots are electrode placements, okay, or crazy pine cones. So there's three tasks here. If we look over on the far side there, we have the standard target. And that's what I just described to you. A's and B's, press the button every time you see a B. Nothing fancy about it. The B just comes up 20% of the time. And at those electrode placements, we find that impulsive aggressors have a significantly lower P300. It's too small. And it's too late. It's too long. The P300 is largest over the parietal area. That's where you would normally find it to be the largest because that's probably at least the dipole and I don't want to get all crazy, but the, the source of electrical activation is po pointed in that direction. Okay, So you find it largest there. So that was no big surprise. And like I told you, almost every psychopathology has too low of a P300. Now, over here, what Charles did, this is the same task with two different stimuli. He took, he took the A's and B's, and now he threw in letters that they didn't know were going to come up for which there is no response. Because if you think about it, someone who's explosively violent, it's when things change that they don't do so well. When things are different than they normally are. They usually want things to be just the same. Remember the obsessive compulsive personality disorder that I talked about. It, they all have that kind of compulsive tendency. So here, when we call it novel target, that's the B's that they knew to push. And you find almost the same thing. You see, a parietal area, they're too low. Okay. Now, novel, novel. Those are like C and T and X. They don't know they're coming up and there is no response. So there shouldn't really be anything. Just like for the A's, the A's have this little tiny, almost no, it's almost a flat line. And we find that you see they, in the temple areas and more central, they show lower P300s. And what's interesting about that is really there's two different P300s. There's more of a frontal P300 or more anterior P300 that's related to really kind of your um, how, how, how you see the stimulus, how important you see the stimulation or the stimulus that you're looking at. And this parietal P300, the one in the back, which is called P3B sometimes, one's A and one's B, is the decision process. And what Charles is able to show with this uh, P300 study is that it's, it's not just the decision process, it's what I said before, it's this kind of global cognitive deficit. They're having that lower activation that they have is affecting virtually every system in their brain. They're not only are they not allocating enough resource for the decision, but they don't even appreciate the importance of the stimulus, which gets right back to that little P1 that we talked about initially. It seems so insignificant, happens at 100 milliseconds, and when my student Becky found it, she goes, oh, that's just a fluke. She didn't think much of it, because really nobody ever looks at that little wave. And so uh, it gets right back to that. They're simply not activated well enough. The sensory information that goes in is bad, so the decision process that comes is messed up. So that was Charles's P3 data. Now let's summarize all of this kind of point by point. That P3, P1, it's too low. Sensory gating is off. Their sensory system is not activated at the level it should be, so it's not going to process the information well. The N100 is too large at baseline, which means, at least to me, along with the next thing, the shorter P1N1 latency, is that they're compensating for this bad sensory processing. They're trying to, as one of my students said, jump onto the stimulus to get it processed very quickly because they, in essence, are compensating for their poor processing. Okay. 
the increased frequency of augmenting, remember where the N1 gets bigger and bigger and bigger? That suggests an arousal deficit, which explains the P1 problem. The reticular activating system or some brainstem nuclei are not modulating the activation, particularly in their cortex, but also in subcortical structures in the, in the limbic system at an appropriate level, which is, should kind of key you into why you would think about using an anticonvulsant, which is what we're going to talk about in a minute. Their P300 is too small. Again, if your early processing is off, your later decisions should also be off. That they only go hand in hand. And they're the P3 is longer, again, part of stimulus evaluation. The problem with this, and the reason it took me 10 years to get to the point that I am right now, is we started right there. We started with the P300 because the theories were that they have some higher cognitive deficit related to the language problems that, that you see in the literature so much, that there's this higher cognitive deficit and that's why they act adequate. They don't have that internal voice to tell them to mediate their behavior. And, and that all sounded wonderful to me as a postdoc. It's just the problem is it doesn't make, it doesn't, I'm, it, it's much simpler than that. It's, it's simple physiology. And uh, so that's where we are at this point. So now let's treat them and see if things change. First, I'm going to show you phenytoin is dilantin. I'm going to show you dilantin data, and then I'm going to show you data from a bunch of anticonvulsants. Let me describe the study to you before we go through. Now, if you remember, I told you we run a radio advertisement for men who have problems controlling their anger. They're screened on the phone. And they, we have a brief interview that's on the phone, and they get the quick screen that I gave you. And then they're brought in, and then the full aggression interview is done with them, and then an all-day assessment, personality, neuropsych, psychophysiology. They have to be impulsively aggressive and show no premeditated acts, okay? They are the pure group. They're not just a mix, okay? Um, they have to have lifetime physical aggression and they have to be physically aggressive, obviously. Throw things, break things, hit people, things like that, all right? Now, they can have no axis one disorder. They have to have an, a normal IQ. Um, you know, weed out any kind of neurological problem. They can't be on any medication. Very stringent criteria. They have to have had at least two outbursts in the month before, and we have some level of aggression they have to be at also. Okay, so then they are put into, with this data here, they were put into a 16-week, what's called a double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover, which means that double-blind means they don't know what they're on and I don't know what they're on, or at least the person testing them doesn't know what they're on. Placebo control means that part of the time they're going to be on a placebo and part of the time they're going to be on the drug. And crossover means they're on one and then they cross over and they go on the other and they never know when they change. So for six weeks, they were on the drug. Then there was a two-week washout and then in six weeks they're on the placebo or the other way around, depending on how they're randomized. And actually, initially, what we do with them is the first two weeks they are on the placebo, everybody is. That we get a baseline on them then. Because they come in and the guy says, oh, I, yeah, I might have one or two a month. You know, and then I interview their wife and they have like one or two a day. You know, they, they have no concept of how often this is happening. In, in fact, we learned early on they are worthless as far as filling out the outburst checklist when they have an outburst. They never fill them out because they don't think they ever have them. I mean, they might have a, a bad one to them is when their wife throws them out of the house or something. So they have to have a reporter, wife, roommate. Uh, sometimes the boss has done it if they're real close. It just depends. Somebody who's with them most of the time, most every day. They fill out a little thing called an overt aggression scale every time they have an outburst. Uh, that has a list of things that happen when you get angry, from yelling at somebody to putting somebody in the hospital. It's a long checklist. You just check off everything that applies. You put the date and the time, put a little envelope, and they bring it back. Every two weeks they come in. They get a little pill bottle that has their medication in it, and that lasts two weeks. And then when they come in, we go over the sheets with them. We interview them. What happened here? Tell me what this is. And they fill out some mood state measures and do some measures. All right. So they got to come back every two weeks for 16 weeks, and we're going to get a lot of measures. By the time we have a huge file on them, and we can really tell them what's going on. Okay? That makes sense? And then we have the wife or reporter, whoever it is, come the first time where they're interviewed, and they come the last time, and we go all, all the results with the patient and the in individual. And if it was successful, we refer them out and they're maintained. The person, 
right now out the longest is a guy who's been out, I'd say almost about five years now, and he's maintained and doing very, very well. Uh, most of our guys we still have contact with, uh, and they're, many of them are several years out and doing really fantastic. Like I said, around 70% right now, effective. Okay, this looks familiar. If you remember, P1, I have a little pointer went out, unfortunately, or I would point to it. P1, N1, P2, okay, remember that? Baseline, placebo, PHT. This little thing right here is. Okay. So, you've got the baseline's the yellow line. That's the one you saw before. The placebo is the blue line. There's no difference, okay? Um, we don't find a difference in the size of the P1, and this is group data. So there's about, there's about 30 guys right there. Remember, they're their own control, so they're their best control. So they're on a placebo and they're also on the drug. So there's no difference there. And then we find this uh, P1 got bigger, N1 got smaller, P2 didn't change, we never found it. Remember, the N1 was too big to begin with, remember that? And the P1 was too small, one got bigger, one got smaller. This is just the PZ, but we find it in all the electrode sites. Now that's kind of interesting. So, what about the latency? Remember the latency, the whole complex was too early? Well look, there's the drug, or the baseline, excuse me, the, the baseline, uh, before they ever take anything, the yellow, the placebo, after six weeks of placebo, it actually is a little bit earlier at PZ, and then look at the, P, at the dilantin. It dramatically pushed that back. Now, what's interesting about that is when we first found that, I thought that was really amazing. But then one of my students found this very obscure, written in Japanese, brief report that was in a Japanese journal where um, I believe the man's name was Yaguri, had actually given Dilantin and several other um, anticonvulsants to normals and did this actual measure, the P1, N1, P2, and he found that even in normals, it pushed their P1, N1 back. But in a normal person, when it's already right, that would mess up their attention. And that's what you see with high dose dilantin. You see the person have, they're kind of lethargic and out of it, and, and you can get some cognitive problems. But if your P1, N1, P2 is too early, and I give it to you and it moves it, now it's normal. So what we've seen is P1 got bigger, N1 got smaller, latency changed. I'm on my way to Nobel here, okay? So now, that's all good and fine, but that doesn't mean anything if they're not, they're not less aggressive, because isn't that what it's all about? Because remember I just told you, Yaguri, he changed all that in normals, and what did that, that doesn't really matter in the context of behavior if behavior is what we're looking at. Okay, so this is one of the very first studies we ever did. This was published in 1997, but the study ran for some period of time before that. Um, this is a study we did in the prison. Okay, these are all prisoners here. And at that time, we weren't even calling them premeditated, we were calling them non-impulsive aggressive. Because that was, in fact, one says premeditated, and one says non-impulsive aggressive. That was the term used at that time in, in back when we first started that study in the 80s, okay? That was a, a, a idea put forward by Marco Lanoila, the idea of non-impulsive aggressive. The person's aggressive, but that's non-impulsive, which is premeditated, okay? So what we have here is we have FZ, CZ, and PZ, which are the midline frontal site, central site, and parietal site. They're just electrode sites. And we have the P, 300 that I just mentioned. If you look at this one right here, it's kind of easy to see. The impulsive aggressive inmates and non-impulsive aggressive inmates. There's 35 people per group here, okay? Now, what, what you have is, we have these guys in prison and we're gonna be able to use the guard reports of their violence as measures of their violence. This is them being violent in the prison, not what they did to get in the prison. They could have, you know, stole something to get in prison. These are guys who are violent in the prison. That's how they were recruited. We got on the the computer at the prison, we looked for guys who had certain numbers of incident reports, and then we asked them to be in the study, okay? They get nothing for being in the study other than every time they were brought to the lab from the prison was we bought them lunch. That's all they get. They get no special treatment for being in the study, and they can, it's totally voluntary, and they can quit if they want. Um, we also know if they're taking the medication because we're getting blood levels on them, so it, it's not 
And believe me, plenty of them don't take the medication. So that, that's a problem enough. Prisoners are not the most compliant subject group in the world. So uh, they also always think you're trying to poison them or something, and they're always looking at the pills and stuff. So, so anyway, so this is the task. This is the A's and the B's that I told you about. The B makes the P300 large. So if you look at this first one right here, the little dotted line is the A, and the solid line is the B. Okay. Now I told you the little dotted line doesn't make a very big P300. It's pretty small. These should not be the same size. What they should look like is something like this. See how this really large peak here and then it's kind of a smaller one? Well, that's in a premeditated. Remember, premeditated have perfectly normal P300s, okay? So these are, not only are these too small, or at least the, the low probability, but they're processing A's and B's as if they were the same thing. And that's the same thing that Charles found when he threw in those novel stimuli. The novel ones and the A's and the B's, it's like the same thing. Well, that makes a lot of sense if you think about the fact that they kind of process everything the same. Everything's novel to an impulsive aggressor, and it's not processed right. So you see what I'm saying? So even if it's happened 100 times before, it's a new experience. Well, didn't your wife ever not have dinner ready before? Oh, sure, plenty of times. So, I mean, and, that, and he meant that. Well, why didn't you go off then? I don't know, I had a bad day at work. That's exactly, that's a quote, that's what he said. So, here's the placebo, a little bit of a change, and there's a little bit of a placebo effect, and that's what I mentioned earlier. Tomorrow, I think at 10, I can't remember, they moved me one time, at 10 o'clock I'm gonna give a talk on placebo effects in these guys, and I'm gonna actually relate this stuff to this meeting. I'm gonna talk about responsibility and, and stuff like that in the context of, of explosive violence where you lose control of your behavior. There's a little bit of a placebo effect, but nothing significant. And then look on the dilantin, a huge change. But look over here. It's the same thing the whole way. It changed the P300, the, or normalized it in the impulsive aggressor. It didn't change it in the premeditated aggressor. And then when we look at, this is set up as a dose response, but when you look at the uh, frequency of outburst, what you find is that the black, there's a little bit of a change just because they're in the study, but it's not significant. Large drop off with dose on the impulsive aggressor, a significant change in impulsive aggressive outbursts. It works on impulsive aggressors. It does not work on premeditated aggressors. It normalizes their brain activity, the impulsive aggressor. Everything that we find at baseline that's off is switched back to normal and their behavior changes. In the premeditated aggressor, remember there was nothing wrong. And so you don't see any problem. Okay, that's to me that was that was it. Now we now at at this point right here, we had not developed this. We um, we took people that were 100% impulsive and 100% premeditated. They stand out of a crowd, but you have to interview like 500 prisoners to get the 35 in each group. That's why I went to the terms predominantly, because people who are premeditatively violent often show some impulsive violence. But usually people who are impulsively violent don't show very much premeditated. Uh, and so then we spent the next, I don't know how many years, believe it or not, I mean, this seems like such a simple thing, developing this. And really, the, the, I think the important part of this is not all the stuff at the beginning, but it's all the stuff on page nine with the reliability data. And that is, th this is no good if you can't go do it. But I promise you that you can take this and go do it tomorrow if you just follow the instructions right here and you'll get the same results we can. Because you have to remember, I have, like, you know, I have a lab and I have graduate doctoral students coming in and if they can't pick that up like that, I can't see every person to do every single one of these. I have to have something that's, you know, it's just like any test. So we've been able to get that to a point where it's pretty easy to do. So this was pretty telling to us. It works on one, it doesn't on the other, which gets back to my idea where I say one has more of a bio load than perhaps the other. Now again, we could be looking in the wrong areas, but I think it gets back to control. One has control and one doesn't have control. The problems that we find that are biological are control oriented, control related. And, you know, and then we seem to be able to fix that with anticonvulsant. Think about an anticonvulsant for a minute. This was dilantin or phenytoin, which is its chemical name. 
Phenytoin's main uh, mechanism of action is that it blocks sodium channels and some calcium channels, which means that in a seizure, which is what it's normally used for, epilepsy, when that epileptic foci goes off and just starts a firestorm across your cortex, it has, it has um, increased the membrane excitability. It, I shouldn't say it that way. It has made it less likely that the membrane will become excited and, and fire an action potential. Okay, so it's harder for that to spread out across the cortex, so it isolates it, all right? It's doing the same thing in these guys. Remember, their arousal modulation problem that I talked about. So what's happening is that, you know, they may be under aroused when nothing's going on, but then a stimulus comes in. Remember, they're processing every stimulus the same. They go through the roof. Some of the data I'm not going to show you here is our heart rate data. I don't know why I'm not going to show it, but I'm just not going to show it. We, uh, we use a task called the PACESAT, and I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's this terrible neuropsych test. It's a paced auditory serial attention test. The person, numbers come at the person from a computer, it's a computer voice, three, seven, nine, two. They have to add the last two numbers together and ignore the one that's coming at them and then they have to take that number and add it to the one before it. So three, seven, nine. They have to add seven and three together and ignore the nine. Those things, they start out coming at 2.6 seconds, a number. Then it gets faster and faster. So they got to add the seven and three together and say 10. Computer records that. Then they had to add together the nine and the seven. And then the next time, it's really, it's impossible. It's really, really hard. And it really pisses you off. So uh, in fact, to a point that they jump up and start yelling, and, you know, I have just tape after tape of just basically, you know, five minutes of the F word. Now, we're not doing it to get that test. We're doing it because we know it increases their arousal. So we have them monitored, their EKG is running, and we start it, and they start doing it, okay? And their heart rate goes from here to here, and it never comes back down. Whereas a normal person's, even if they can't do it very well, goes up initially, and then they habituate, even during the test, and they come back down to normal level. And an impulsive individual, not an impulsive aggressor, just a person just impulsive, not aggressive, they are always under aroused. It goes up a little bit initially, in fact, more than a normal person, then it comes right back down, but it always stays lower than a normal person. Remember that idea of optimal level? They're not at it. So we, we can see with this heart rate data that indeed they just shoot through the roof physiologically but they can't come back down. I get guys jumping up and screaming in the room and all kinds of stuff. It's, it's really amazing. Well, right now we're writing a paper on the pace set, not using the aggressors, but using the control subjects because we're recommending that it's a terrible test to use in the neuropsych battery because what happens if you use that as your second test and you're, you're assessing an anxiety disorder patient? Because it makes a significant change in the heart rate even of a normal but they come back down. But if you have an anxiety disorder or you're depressed or you have any problem related, it's gonna mess up every other test after that. And so we're, uh, we're writing an article right now on that and it really has come out really very nicely. It's amazing. So I can't do the test. I'm yelling at the thing myself, but it's, uh, we, we make them do it a lot of times actually. We, in the original study, we made them do it every two weeks for 16 weeks. So uh, it's really aversive. So, and you would think they would habituate a little bit. Oh man, they just, it's terrible. It's really bad, so. Now, I just showed you prisoners. This is a community sample. These are guys that came in off the radio in our original Dilantin study off the radio. Baseline, placebo, phenytoin. You see there's a clear placebo effect, okay? There clearly is one, even in the mood states I'm gonna show you. But it is not significantly different than the baseline and both the placebo and the baseline are significantly different from the dilant from the PHT. Um, you know, you get, this looks a little more exaggerated because it's so big, but you get a little bit of a drop off with, and you gotta look at that, this is mean outburst per week, you go from 1.4 to one a week versus less than one a week, down to like 0.6 or so a week, which is less than one a week. I mean, you can imagine, just kind of put that in context. I mean, if you're having, maybe a, two a month versus one every week, that's a big change. But usually what we're seeing is about 70% of the guys are having a significant change, and what we're seeing is about a 75% reduction in, in their aggression. You gotta remember, in this instance, you've got guys, you know, I kinda do myself a disservice, because I've got guys that are having 
in six weeks they have 26 outbursts and I got guys in six weeks that have six outbursts but you're having a significant change in both so I'm really kind of doing myself a disservice I ought to probably put them in little but even clumping them all together you still see this really nice change now let's talk about mood states uh, the profile of mood states is a is a measure it measures seven different mood states tension anxiety depression objection anger hostility conf confusion bewilderment fatigue vigor and two others and uh, and so it's something you can fill out over and over and it'll tell you how you were over the last 10 days so it's a state measure not a trait measure Does that, that makes sense and it's it is a gold standard in drug studies when that look at moods especially in like the studies of depression and things like that here are the three that we're most interested in tension anxiety depression injection and anger hostility you know, one theory of impulsive aggression is that they're too angry. It's not that they don't have enough control. It's just that they have enough control to just have too much anger. They're just spilling out, okay? Um, I never bought that, okay? Uh, another one that we suggest is this idea of anxiety. So we would, you know, we talked about compulsive aspects. That should change. And then depressed. We know all these guys are depressed that are coming in. They've all been treated for depression, but remember it's the cart before the horse kind of thing. They're depressed because they're aggressive. They're not aggressive because they're depressed. And what we see here is, again, you see a clear uh, placebo effect. In fact, I can tell you that, the, um, that we, don't even, we don't actually even get a, what's called a placebo-controlled effect in the mood states. While the drug is significantly different than the baseline, okay, which suggests an effect, the placebo is not significantly different from either. Okay, does that make sense? But the drug effect is beyond the placebo effect. It's always lower. It's just not what's called placebo controlled, just like, like the aggression effect was. The aggression effect was placebo controlled because the drug is different than the placebo and the baseline. Does that make sense? I, and tomorrow I'll talk a little bit about why I think the way we set up drug studies is doing us a disservice because I'm going to show you these wonderful placebo effects which I don't know if many of you read the American Journal of Psychiatry, but just this year, there have been two large-scale studies in the American Journal of Psychiatry on treating depression with placebos, one of which used an fMRI and showed significant changes with fMRI on placebo. Okay, so the, the thing is, is that we set up our drug studies that they have to be better than placebo, but aren't there physiological and psychological effects that you know we I mean we are psychologists that's the whole point right so why would it have to be better than a placebo wouldn't the placebo be a measure in, in essence of kind of the psychological phenomenon that's going on so I'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow but what we see here is if we look at depression dejection first by just being in the study they feel better because every two weeks they get to come talk to one of my students or me and encourage them and tell them they're doing so good and their wife or husband or we don't take women in the drugstore but their wife or or whoever that's doing the reporting is saying, oh, I'm so glad you're in the study, and they're getting encouraged so they feel better. They're getting reinforcement. But we get even a, a larger effect with the, the drug. Their tension anxiety is lower. Their anger is lower. They're less angry. They're less tense. They're less depressed. They feel better just by being in the study, but also they feel better when they're on the drug. What I'll show you tomorrow if you come is that the placebo effect doesn't last they'll start not feeling better when they start realizing they're not getting any better. And it starts going away. And uh, whereas the drug effect just keeps getting better and better and better. You know, by the time the guy on placebo is finished, he feels terrible. By the time the guy on the drug is finished, he feels great. You know, so um, that's the difference in running what's called a crossover, where you're on both versus a parallel groups design where you just give somebody the placebo and they never get a chance to be on the drug and you get to watch them over a long period of time. And this one is Dilantin. Yeah, Phenotoa. Right, exactly. That was our initial drug. We are funded by the Dreyfus Health Foundation, which is a, a foundation that's interested in non-epileptic effects of Phenotoa. They, 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 because it, Phenotoa is a very interesting drug. It has all kinds of bizarre effects. It's used uh, as a topical uh, treatment for uh, diabetic ulcers on the feet. It's been used. It's used in cardiac medicine. It's used a lot. It has a lot of weird effects because it has this kind of biostabilizing effect on the on the membrane 
of any tissue. And so it's used, so they fund work that is non-epileptic in nature. And so this is one of their main focus is on aggression, and they've funded us for uh, many years now. And in fact, we've, we've, you know, we've continued on for about four years now. So let's summarize these results, and then I'll show you a little bit of data from our most recent study. Increased P1 amplitude. That's just opposite. That's a normalization from the baseline. Reduced N1. Remember, that's a normalization. Remember, it's too big to begin with on the dilatant. It's, it's lower. Push the latency back. Again, that's normalization from the baseline. P1's larger. We had the de decreased frequency of impulsive aggressive outbursts. And the mood state changes. Now, even beyond that little data that I, that I didn't show you because it's so new is the data that Sarah has worked on. Sarah's my prodigal child with the weird question that she asked all the time. The, um, she's interested in emotional cues because a really long-standing idea of aggression is that they're just missing the cues. They think you're threatening them, so they just missed it. And you know, somehow you could focus you know, some therapy on that. So what she's done is she's taken a number of, of, of pictures that come from the International Effective Picture System, which is a standard battery of effective pictures. They have like pictures of mutilated bodies and guns and you know, like a novel thing, like a chair, and you know, I mean, a neutral thing. So there's neutral pictures and pleasant pictures and unpleasant pictures, and they're all rated on arousal level. So some are high arousal, some are low arousal. What she's done in a normal person, and you show them neutral, pleasant, unpleasant, have them categorize it. You get what's called an LPP, which is a late positive potential. It's a positive wave that's even later than the P300. It happens at around 600 milliseconds. But it's purported to be a measure of kind of emotional processing. Um, you know, obviously, again, the size of it and the time it happens suggest how well that's going. So what she suggested was that that would be off. What you find is for effective pictures, whether pleasant or unpleasant, you get a much larger one than you do for neutral, which I think you'd expect because it's more arousing. Okay? She expected it to be off. And, and it is off. But it's not off in the way that you would expect if you bought into an emotional cue idea. An emotional cue theory would suggest that maybe they, they tend to categorize things more as negative and they miss the positives and things like that. Well, we didn't find that. What we found is it's too small and it's too late, which is what you'd expect from everything else. Remember, the early processing's off, so everything's later and they're not allocating appropriate resource for these higher cognitive. They, they make more errors. They make enormous number more categorization errors. But it's not just for neutrals, and ne I mean for negative stimuli, it's for positive and everything. They just make tons of errors. They can't categorize these. So granted, they do miss emotional cues, but it's not because they have a problem processing emotion, it's because they have a problem processing anything. So that's how that came out, and she's working that up right now. And we've run that that were violent and in the drug study patients here. Now, you can't repeat that battery because once they see it, it loses its emotional content. And so we only have that a single time. We don't have it uh, after, before and after the meds. That's the beauty of, physio of some of these other physiological measures. You can do them as many times as you want. They never habituate. And you can watch the drug change. You can't always do that with neuropsych. And you certainly... You can't do that with most of the self-reports since they're lying on them anyway. You know, so that's the thing. Now here, we have a new study going, and this is a parallel group design, which means there are four different groups, and they're all running at the same time. Um, a person is either put into a placebo group, which means they only get the placebo the entire eight weeks they're in the study. A person's put into a dilantin group, PHT, a carbamazepine, which is Tegretol, uh, which is CBZ, and a VA, which is valproic acid, which is Depakote. Okay? These are three different anticonvulsants. The baseline in this instance on this slide is just a combination of the baselines for all of them to kind of give you a feel. And you can see, again, there is a placebo effect. It's, it's, and we, right now, there's six guys in every one of these, these cells right here, so it's early on in the study. But we are getting a very nice effect on, with the Tegretol and the Dilantin, just like we'd expect. The valproic acid has a very different mechanism of action. It works on the gabinergic system. Um, and it doesn't seem to be working as well. Their mood states do not change. At least in the people who run so far, they feel terrible. They're angry and they don't feel well on the valproic acid. They are getting some reduction, but they just don't feel well. 
Whereas on the Tegretol, which has the biggest mood elevating effect, they feel great. They come in after two weeks, the first time we see them, they're all like, hey, they're cracking jokes. And that's one of the difficult things to this study is that, you know, in my lab, uh, right now I have all, all female graduate students, and they kind of have this deal where they try to guess who's on what because they can tell because they're nicer and happy and they smile and they crack jokes when they're on the medication and when they're not they're all ticked off and angry and they don't want to come in and they have to be rescheduled for their appointments and things like that there is a clear change in their affect and I have to just kind of bite my lip and go out in the hall and laugh because you know I would say most of the time unfortunately they can guess because there's such a huge change in these guys it's unbelievable now back to Arthur Jones for a minute Arthur Jones the video I showed you they did this little piece on him on TV and a week later I got a call from a guy 60 year old man and he said he wanted to be in the study and he said he'd seen the thing on TV I thought oh, okay well I got a few other calls from the TV thing he came in interviewed him and his wife he knew Arthur Jones it wasn't because he just saw it he'd gotten in a fight with Arthur Jones they got in a fight in a barn okay they're, they were friends, quote unquote, and they had been in at least one physical altercation. The guy that came in, he was much more violent than Arthur Jones, 60 year old, but fairly violent, his whole life violent. And he said if that could help Arthur Jones, then he knew he needed to be there because he needed help too. Um, and he was just one example of the unbelievable life change that we've seen in these impulsive aggressors. You know, the 60 year old man weeping when we went through all the data with him because he had had such an enormous effect. Um, it's really unbelievable and incredibly rewarding. Uh, we have run subsequent studies where we're just looking at some weird part of their brain or something where we're not doing a drug study on them or something. And we call them and say, would you like to, can we pay them, you know, like 30 bucks or something to be, you know, we're doing a high density array where we're trying to map some underlying dipoles in their brain and stuff. They won't take the money because they feel like they owe me so much. And then that, that sounds like a really bizarre statement, but more than one of them, almost all of them say, you saved my life. This says to me or the girls working in the lab, I, I'm not gonna, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'm not gonna take your money. I'll be in any study you want. It's really unbelievable. And what's interesting is they all are sent to me basically because nobody else could do anything with them or wanted to do anything with them because they're violent. I, one psychiatrist I work with, she's a fantastic, one of the best psychiatrists I've ever worked with. Um, she tells me never to send her anybody violent because she wants to deal with it. She's just so difficult in her practice. They require so much time. Um, and that's because she's treating it as a symptom. She doesn't tend, anticonvulsants are not a common psychoactive substance that's used. I mean, in institutionalized populations like mentally retarded and things like that, it's common practice to treat them with anticonvulsants if they're agitated or aggressive. But you would never think about treating somebody that showed up at the clinic because they must have some mental illness. That, or a head injury. Head injuries are commonly given anticonvulsants after they've had a head injury, first for seizure uh, problems and then to keep their agitation down. Even demented patients in some instances it's used. But you would never think about treating someone with a personality disorder, quote unquote, that was aggressive with that. But hopefully we're trying to change that a little bit and that's where our work has taken us. And these are some of the people I'd just like to thank uh, that if, you know, none of this would have happened without most of them. Ernie Barrett's at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. He was, he is very much involved in the development of this, these scales that you have in your hand there. And there's Sarah and her crazy question. And Kevin Grieve is a neuropsychologist that works with us. And um, Laura, Becky Houston is at the University of Connecticut uh, Department of Psychiatry. So one of my former students, Charles Mathias, is at UT uh, Houston, and then Nicole Pittman, uh, and the Dreyfus Health Foundation. So at this point, what I'd like to do, and I'm right where I want to be, I'd like, we're supposed to end at like 10 till, they tell, told me. Uh, I'd like to see if there are any questions, or if maybe any of you, I don't know how many clinicians we have, or people who see, have any specific patients you'd like to discuss. Uh, I can give you some, if there aren't a lot of questions, I can give you some suggestions. Treatment. We suggest it was effective anticonvulsant treatment and cognitive behavior therapy. We found cognitive behavior therapy very useful for them. Um, we, uh, you know, anger management, 
whatever that is. They almost have all been through that. I actually had a guy attack another guy in an anger management that, that is really useless for somebody who is so impulsive they can't even sit still. Uh, we have not actually done any work with children yet other than we are beginning to move in that direction and the study that we've just put in. Uh, it is our feeling that... Uh, and, and one of the things that was the impetus for that study was the number of times we have had impulsive aggressors say to us, I am here because I am seeing this in my son, who is about eight years old now. He has, is physically violent to his mother. He throws things. I've heard that more times than I want to. So what we're doing is, like I said, we're going to take the aggressor and look at the children, male and female, and see if you see the same kind of aggression in them or any aggression at all. Our thought is, is that there will be some kind of transfer of the same type of aggression. Because if impulsive aggression has a heavy bio load and some social, you know, learn, which we'd expect, you'd expect to see it in the kid. And then if, if premeditated is a learned type of behavior, then the child should be learning the same kind of underlying kind of interactive behavior that they see in their father and so um, you know we expect to see both it's uh, I, let me just tell you real quickly about you know you may be thinking well he talks a lot about men I'll, let me tell you about a woman okay I'll tell you a lot of, a lot of the, all the data you saw here with the exception of the um, prison data any of the drug data was equal numbers of men and women in every group okay this, the most violent person I've ever met in my life and I've met a lot a lot more than any most people would. Um, was 21 years old, female. It was 411. Okay. She was sent to me from a clinic because she had picked up her two-year-old by the head and thrown him into the wall. Okay. Uh, she had four children by four different men, only one of which she still had because they'd all been taken away from her. Why you take away some and leave others? I don't know. She had would on regular occasion attack people in bars, attack people, she's incredibly violent. White female, uh, pretty, I think she made it about the eighth grade. Normal IQ, she wasn't MR or anything. Um, severe personality disorder, antisocial with real borderline tendencies. Um, she um, had greased up the stairs of her mother's apartment in an attempt for her mother to fall and break her neck. She had put rat poison in her mother's food in an attempt to kill her. Now, are those impulsive or premeditated? Those are premeditated, okay? It's not rocket science, okay? I mean, it's pretty obvious. You know, they're not, it's not like you go, is it impulsive? Or, you know, it's, no, the thing, when you do ask a question is when it seems impulsive and they may have taken a, an hour to think it out before they did it, then it gets a little, maybe a little iffy, but usually it's not like that. She was clearly premeditatedly violent, but she was sent to me for an explosive outburst. Her kid was bothering her, and she threw him into the wall. It wasn't planned. She just doesn't have a lot of patience. So if I just went by why she was sent to me, I would have thought, well, she's explosive. But upon interviewing her and, a, and one of the, the women who was the mother of the guy whose child she still had. Does that make sense? Uh, who was taking care of her and what she had done, you know, her interviewing her, we realized this woman was clearly premeditated in nature and frightening um, because you would totally underestimate her. Short, thin, apparently weak when you looked at her, but she would kill you in an instant if she thought it would benefit her. Um, so that was a no-brainer. That was easy. Now, what do you suggest for her? There's no, there's nothing. We, we suggest what we suggest for all premeditated, and that is individual long-term psychotherapy. But with the caveat, it isn't going to work because she's your worst-case scenario. An antisocial female with borderline tendencies walking into a therapist's office who's violent. I mean, that's, that's just, she's going to manipulate the situation. She's going to convince the therapist that she's getting better. And if it's not someone who deals with aggression on a daily basis, they're going to buy into it. And so you know, she's a worst-case scenario. I mean, her child should be taken away from her, clearly. So that was, that was the most 
frightening individual ever met. Oh, I didn't put it in a different category. Narcissistic is a personality disorder, so most of the narcissists I've seen tended to be impulsive aggressive. I didn't put it in a different category. I just had it clustered by the, by the, in the DSM clusters. There, yeah, well, there's the DSM cluster A, B, and C. The cluster B is commonly thought of as the impulsive kind of antisocial cluster. You've got antisocial, borderline, narcissistic history on it. You have all the fun ones right there together. The thing is, is that any personality disorder, any period could be premeditated or could be. You don't worry about the ideology, you know, where it's coming from. You worry about the behavior. What's the behavior? That's the difference. You look at the behaviors, classify them, and then you turn to the person because that'll lead you to what's going on. Now, I'll give you an example of a, an impulsive aggressor. That was a good premeditator, and that was a female, which a lot of people are surprised about. Um, we don't see as many females, but again, that's because most females, most of the men come in because one of their family members, particularly a wife, has said, you get help or I'm leaving. Most men don't go, if you don't go get help, I'm leaving. If you don't stop beating up on me, I'm leaving. I mean, and I've had that. First man I ever saw was an impulsive aggressor. I walked around the corner of my office. He was standing against my office door, heavily tattooed, long hair, looked like a biker. And he was watching all the college girls walk by and looked like a wolf sitting up on a hill watching a sheep, okay? and um, very depressed. In fact, virtually met the criteria for depression. He didn't fully, but almost, very depressed individual, very mean and not very nice. Antisocial personality disorder, all out. Now, in the clinical circles, he was thought of as almost psychopathic in a sense because he's antisocial personality disorder. But when you talk to him about his aggression, now he put himself in a lot of bad situations. He went to bars, hung out with bikers, things like that. But it was all explosive violence. People bumped into him, he went off. Uh, someone, you know, he thought someone stole something from him with no evidence, he went off. It wasn't a plan to have him go get the guy, he just exploded, you know, at people. You know, his, his girlfriend talked back to him, he attacked her. It was all explosive. Um, you know, and so when, you did, when we did the neuropsych on him, he shows everything I just showed you. Executive function problems, terrible personality pathology, uh, the psychophysiological difference. You do the same thing to my young friend, the girl, four foot eleven. She's fine. I mean, she's low IQ because she's not very educated, but she did great on everything. You know, much better than I would have ever anticipated. Because remember, all I've got is what she did to get there. Now, what he did to get there is he keeps getting arrested for getting into fights and stuff. So he went to the clinic and said, "I need some help," and they go, "Well, we can't help you because you only have an Axis two disorder." Now, they had tried to treat him for depression. They said they kind of fudged it a little bit and said, well, he's depressed. So they gave him an antidepressant. Well, he felt a little bit better, but he was still having problems, which made him depressed again. And so um, that's, that's what you, an impulsive aggressor will look like. They'll have lots and lots of outbursts. And they aren't all too happy to talk. They'll talk about remorse. I wish I wasn't like this. And a lot of times it's very genuine. Um, a lot of times they're very weepy about when they describe the instance, about what it's done to their life. Uh, it's often described as a release. You know, I was, once it happened, I almost felt better afterwards, but then they feel remorseful for the fact that it happened. They don't remember it very well. They can't even describe, that's why when we go over those sheets that the reporter fills out, they won't even remember half the stuff that happened. They go, I did that? I don't remember that. Did I actually do that? You know, the person would have written it right down there. They did they barely remember because their cognitive function is impaired during the outburst. It's almost seizure-like. Thus, back to the idea of an anticonvulsive. And you know that even in the seizure literature, you have, you know, inner ictal, the temporal of epileptics, a lot of times, or not a lot of times, sometimes you have a what appears to be an aggressive outburst related to temporal of epilepsy. And so it all kind of links up together. But that's a good example of an impulsive aggressor and a premeditated. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, how can you sit there and aren't you afraid of these people and things like that? And no, they're very polite. Because remember, they either want help, which means they'll tell me anything, or they're lying. And they certainly aren't going to be aggressive towards me if they're trying to get their child or 
stay on parole or all, you know what I'm saying? So they're going to be really good. So I've only had, um, actually only two incidences ever in which we had someone in 10 years, um, a, one of the prison inmates who kind of got through a screen and well, I had a little, maybe a little bit of psychosis going on there that we missed, uh, was convinced that we were trying to poison him with the food that we bought him for lunch. And while he was getting the EEG, jumped up and ripped all the electrodes off of him. But there were guards there and they took him away. He was huge too. And then um, one of the, one guy had, he was the most impulsive person I've ever met in my life. He was so disinhibited that he couldn't stop touching the equipment. So he kept turning it off and turning it up and messing with the knobs. And, and so the, the testers came and got me and they said, look, we already warned him like 10 times. He won't stop. He turned the pace set off while he was doing it and all this kind of stuff. So I went down and I told him that we weren't going to be able to test him because he was too distant. He could not inhibit himself enough to be tested. And uh, he went crazy, jumped up, started screaming, tearing up paper. That was the only time I wasn't scared, but the the students actually thought that he and I were going to become physical. But I realized that it was more of a display because his girlfriend was there than it was a act. If he had touched me, he would have been in jail so fast, and he knew that. I mean, he had come there to try to get some help, but uh, you know, he went just crazy, yelling, screaming, throwing things. Um, so uh, that's the only two times in ten years that. It, but they're really usually pretty good patients. So. And that's another thing I'll talk about tomorrow is that I think they're better patients than we give them credit for. Uh, I think we just have to treat them the right way. So any questions? Well, all right. Well, I thank you. Um, if you do have any questions or you think any later, my email and uh, phone number are on here. Please, you know, contact me. Um, I'll be happy to, like I said, send you PDF files of anything we have. Uh, you're also, you know, more than welcome to use the material here. Uh, right now it's being used uh, in a study at the University of Texas Medical School in Houston. It's being used in a large prison study at UCLA. It, uh, we're setting up a study at the Chester Mental Health Center in Illinois, which is a hospital for a criminally insane. And we are the, um, I'll be meeting with the Federal Bureau of Prisons at the end of, U.S. Federal Bureau of Prisons at the end of the month. They are interested in, in uh, putting this into some of their prison system. So it is starting to, to be used. We also use it in the juvenile system um, around uh, the metro New Orleans area for intake on aggressive adolescents. So we are gathering adolescent data right now. Um, and I've been working with Paul Frick, who studies antisocial behavior in children. He, look, he calls it impulsive and callous unemotional. We were working independently, and he came up with that. And so uh, that very similar. He finds, you know, the impulsives, uh, you can find the pure impulses, but callous and emotional tend to be kind of mixed. They'll show both the callous and emotional acts and impulsive. The problem with children is that what's called aggression in children is not always aggression. A lot of times it's antisocial behavior. It's truancy. It's uh, things like that. Uh, whereas when I talk to these guys and I say, you know, we talk about a lifelong history and we go through a life history, they're talking about physical violent acts as children, but there aren't a lot of studies where you look at physically violent children. A lot of times there's a lot of other things mixed in there. Even in, in Paul's work, a lot of times he looks at antisocial aspects as an aggression is just a component. Um, aggression to an 8-year-old is not the same as aggression to a 21-year-old, so it's a little hard to... To look at so but we are trying to start to move it down we're looking at some adhd symptomatology and, and some different things like that so well thank you i thank you for your attention